So the invited talk is given by Menno Feldhorst, who is an experimental physicist and group leader at uh, QTech and uh, at the Kavli Institute of Nanoscience at the Art University of Technology in the Netherlands. Uh, Menno has been a major driving force in the development of quantum bits and quantum processors based on uh, spins of single electrons. Uh, despite his young age, he has already published quite a few breakthrough papers in the field. Uh, furthermore, in my opinion, his research style is uh, also remarkable in the sense that he's not only focusing on, on the next experimental steps, but also provides long-term strategies and solutions on how to scale up spin qubit architectures. Lastly, let me also mention that Menno is very active in quantum technology education. Um, he is the lead of QTech Academy, where he helped developing massive online courses, which have attracted uh, already over 80,000 students. So Menno's talk today uh, is entitled Quantum Information Processing with Semiconductor Technology from Qubits to Integrated Quantum Circuits. Uh, thanks a lot, Menno, for accepting the invitation, and uh, we are looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much. Um, so, now I should see the screen. Thank you very much for uh, the invitation. It's uh, it's an honor to present uh, in front of you. It's actually. Uh, the first presentation I'm giving today, and I'm still figuring out whether that, that's really a nice thing of all these online presentations uh, or not. Uh, but, but it's a great pleasure to also present here. And, and I actually wanted to start with, uh, uh, with what's often put as a provocative question on conferences. And that's the statement, uh, when will we have the quantum computer? And then there are my mind three categories of, of answers. There's people that say in five years, we will have a quantum computer. And in five years, they will say in five years, we will have a quantum computer. And that repeats. Then there may be the more conservative people that would say you know, in, in 20 years or so, there will be some quantum computer. And then there's actually the group of people who would say, well, we already have it now, right? You can go to the IBM quantum experience login and, and uh, make an account uh, and, and just work with a quantum computer. There's even in, in Europe, a quantum computer in the Netherlands, quantum is fire and everyone can program it. And, and of course, the discussion is much broader than that. And, and I think it's useful to actually compare the status of quantum technology with the development of, of classical technology. And so here, I wanted to start actually with, with uh, a brief look at, at history. And so here you see the invention or the development of the first transistor. This was made in, in Germanium, uh, where really the first things were demonstrated that, that really enabled the information age. Now, of course, we have now many qubit platforms, uh, I believe, or beyond that status. Then if you go to the next step, let's say the, the 1950s or so, there you had uh, transistor radios. And this was really still a two to the force where each and every component had to be soldered together. Uh, and that of course poses challenges like how to scale further from that. And that's where I also believe where quantum technology is today. Uh, we can already make larger systems, uh, perhaps do to some extent useful things, um, but not, yeah, we're, we're facing this, this challenge on how to scale further. And, and perhaps to come back to, to the 1950s, Jack Martin, uh, vice president of Bell Labs by then, uh, he called this the tyranny of numbers, how to scale up. And so he was a believer of, of uh, making um, components with a greater functionality, right? So if, if you, instead of a transistor, you have a component that can do multiple things, uh, you don't have to scale the number, uh, but you can still make complexer systems. And also today, this is something that we see with quantum technology that people, for example, try to develop um, Qtrids to access a greater Hilbert space, for example. Um, with classical technology, uh, we know this was not the way to go. Um, sorry, uh, just one second. Apologies. Um, so for classical technologies, the way forward was the uh, integrated circuit. Um, 
and that really enabled to scale further and that enabled to put billions of transistors uh, on the single chip. And therefore, I think we can now pose the question, uh, can the second quantum revolution where we learn to use, um, uh, where we using active, uh, actively quantum mechanics, uh, can it learn from the first quantum uh, revolution? Um, and, and so there are already some proposals, ideas toward that. In particular, one aspect is, is the, the ideas on, on making, for example, crossbar arrays, where you have shared control, like in DRAM, or make multiplexers to efficiently address many qubits. And so there are many ideas from that. And, and here in this talk, I want to go a little bit of, of different of these approaches and how to uh, connect it to our qubit research. Um, now, first thing, of course, is, is uh, can we learn from it? Well, already in 1998, um, there was a seminal proposal from Daniel Loss and David Di Vincenzo with the statement to actually use that semiconductor technology to build um, quantum technology, quantum computation with quantum dots. The second seminal work uh, was the work by Bruce Kane and to identify silicon um, as the material to use. Um, to go a little bit on that, to, to, on that proposal, so quantum dots, what is it? Uh, quantum dot is an island that can contain a discrete number of electrons uh, with a discrete energy. Um, and due to the charging, for example, there's energy, the charging uh, clump interaction, and this energy scale is a few million electron volts. In addition to that, there's the confinement energy due to the uh, wave function that has a finite size. And this energy uh, is the orbital energy, which is also on the order of a million electron volt. And so in terms of temperature, therefore we all have to work at, at very low temperatures um, on the order of a Kelvin or, or even below that. Then uh, in this proposal of Daniel Loss and, and David Di Vincenzo, they uh, then consider, for example, to use a single electron where you then can use the spin state as a qubit. And then you need some readout mechanism to convert spin to charge, and then you need to measure charge. In addition of that, um, to actually manipulate qubits, there's something uh, called electron spin resonance, where you drive Rabi rotations by applying AC currents, for example, to generate an AC magnetic field to drive uh, qubit rotations. The interaction between wave functions leads to two qubit interactions, uh, and for example, the swap as they proposed. And finally, they believe that, that uh, by using the spin state, the coherence can be long because intrinsically spins may not be sensitive to electric fields, electric noise. Now, um, since then, there have been uh, developments of many different types of qubits. Uh, for example, singular triplet qubits, I think we also hear later about it, uh, hybrid qubits, exchange only qubits. And, and quite often there the idea is to use uh, a different space to perhaps more efficient driving or less sensitivity to it. However, uh, still today, the single spin is the most advanced and, and I think it's still very promising and it can do things that, that other platforms cannot do. For example, the shuttling of quantum information. And so it's still a very elegant way of, of defining the qubit. And therefore I'll also focus on single spin qubits in this presentation. Um, now to start off, I, I believe there are about hundreds of papers or so uh, that would state like, okay, quantum dots are compatible with semiconductor technology. Um, and, and, and so we can leverage off that technology. So something that we showed this year is that that statement is actually really true. And so you, here you see an image of, of qubits made in a completely industrial setting, three millimeter away for integration. Uh, where in that work, we really showed that, that uh, quantum dot qubits can be made with identical manner as, as to the way we make uh, transistors. And that creates prospects to create integrated quantum circuit that really has everything. And so one aspect that we in addition showed is that the electronics may also function at very low temperatures at, at around one Kelvin to make this step where everything may be coming together. Um, but of course, since the electronics, if, if it's still working at one Kelvin, it cannot go too low because of the dissipation. We need to increase the temperature of the spin qubits. And, and here's something what we demonstrated is that spin qubit operation may be even possible at one Kelvin. 
So here what we showed is, is single and two qubit gates uh, using a quantum dot uh, at one Kelvin. Um, now, of course, here you can see that, you know, that the operations are not that good, not that great. In particular, the, the two qubit gate is not perfect. And so we spent some effort in optimizing that. Uh, and one thing to identify here is that we do the two qubit gate by a controlled rotation. So there is um, an electron spin resonance and then in the presence of exchange interaction, we drive a two qubit gate. But this is not really uh, that efficient uh, because the exchange interaction may be much stronger and you want to drive as fast as possible to create fast two qubit gates. So instead of that, uh, we developed some, some uh, new two qubit gates uh, that may be of very high fidelity. In particular, we have a um, uh, diabetic uh, C phase, but also a composite swap. Uh, so what's that? Well, so if we have uh, two spins and we have an exchange interaction between that, uh, that will lead to a swap operation if we pulse very fast. However, since in practice there is a finite Zeeman energy difference between that, um, the evolution is not perfect. There will not be a perfect swap oscillation, but it will be along some tilted angle since there is also a finite C phase uh, interaction here. Um, now, if you just brute force this and try to pulse very fast, then the maximum fidelity that what would achieve is still something like 84% in this particular case. And in many other examples, it will be actually even less than that. So instead of that, what we do is a combining diabetic and adiabatic pulses that kind of overcome the C phase oscillation and time it such that that part ca uh, cancels to, to engineer uh, a, a swap oscillation. And so as you can see here, then, then that's, uh, composite swap takes only a few tens of nanoseconds and, and by doing it so fast also the fidelity goes up and so with some theoretical modeling analysis including uh, the noise sources and so uh, we actually predict that even at a temperature of one kelvin two qubit gates may actually uh, be possible with fidelities exceeding 99 percent so i think that that's very encouraging uh, to, to see now to take a step back I, I i think here what we see now is that okay so um, quantum qubits may be engineered in a semiconductor technology fashion. They may be operated at a higher temperature to integrate with electronics. Uh, but now let's focus on the development of quantum dots themselves. And so very much the preliminary work was done uh, using gallium arsenide and many things have been demonstrated there. Uh, for example, the single spin qubit, coherent coupling between single spins. But a big challenge uh, still is in, in gallium arsenide is the hyperfine interaction. Gallium arsenide is a group free five material and the presence of, of non uh, zero nuclear spins causes strong hyperfine interaction limiting T2 star to something like 10 nanoseconds. So for quantum information that that's a big hurdle uh, to overcome because that's actually on the time scale that one wants to do qubit operations. Silicon uh, overcome that challenge uh, because silicon is a group four material uh, that has uh, nuclear uh, uh, isotopes with zero nuclear spins, in particular silicon 28. And so this really boosted coherence to, to tens of milliseconds. In, in silicon, there are other challenges. For example, the effective mass is rather large. There's a very splitting energy, uh, lots of disorder. And that creates a lot of uh, challenges in scaling up. And so it's, it's a big challenge to move beyond two qubit logic to really make well-defined larger systems. And so that, that really enabled um, to, to stimulate it to, to search for other materials platforms and, and really led to the development of planar germanium, um, where in a few years time from growing materials, we went to a single quantum dot, to a single qubit, to two qubits, uh, quantum dots, two qubits, four quantum dots, four qubit logic. And, and uh, I, I was hoping we were further ahead, but, but now we have a 16 qubit device and already 14 of the 16 quantum dots are tuned. So that, that really shows how fast uh, we can go with the plane of germanium. And I think that's an excellent prospect. So why is that? Well, uh, let's have a focus on how um, to make germanium qubits. So first of all, uh, there has been some tries before, decades of tries to make germanium um, quantum dots. And very often the approach was to start from uh, a silicon germanium on silicon with a low germanium concentration and then gradually increasing this concentration. 
But there, to the, uh, following this approach, the, the overall thickness of the silicon domain needs to be so thick that there are many dislocations, disorder, and so forth. So the real invention there was to start with a germanium uh, layer on top of the silicon and then start from a high concentration of germanium. And so after realizing that and taking advantage of the developments of the silicon fields, um, where it's um, accumulation uh, type of particle systems really boosted that development. Having said that, uh, it's exciting to see that the entire silicon germanium space is rather large. And I, I think many of these aspects are still unexplored to make further progress. Now, what's so interesting about germanium, uh, again, so it has a small effective mass, so one can make relatively large quantum dots and have strong exchange interaction. It's group four, stable uh, nuclear spin, iso spin free isotopes. Um, there's a strong spin orbit coupling, I'll come to that. Uh, there's very little disorder. In addition, one can make all my contacts to metals, and that really simplifies the fabrication and also enables new directions. And finally, since it's planar, uh, it can make use of, of industry. So here you see some example of one of the first uh, structures we made to kind of compare the three platforms. And in particular, the silicon silicon germanium and the germanium silicon germanium were made all in the same system. Um, so to some extent, one can compare there. And what we always observe is that the germanium has a much higher mobility, but also uh, a smaller uh, percolation density, at least in the newer generations. Uh, and it's outperforming silicon um, um, because of the way it, it, uh, the physics bind it. So now we actually have mobilities even beyond a million or so. So this is, this is really a very nice platform to work with. So to make the step for, for, uh, from the material to the quantum dots, uh, here you see a four dot system, uh, including two charge sensors on the side. And so it's something that, that uh, we can do rather efficiently in germanium uh, is that we can go from a stability diagram with almost no interaction to a stability diagram where there's a very strong interaction. So if we measure that using charge polarization lines, we can see that we can, using a few tens of millivolts, tune from virtually no coupling to uh, something on the order of 50 gigahertz or so. Um, having said that, uh, it's important to realize that the 50 gigahertz is not an upper bound. We can even merge to two quantum dots. But then the charge polarization line theory just fails to, to capture it, is not capable to measure it anymore. And, and so we can even have a much stronger interaction. And then I think that's encouraging in particular for quantum simulation proposals. For quantum computation, we typically want to have interaction between one and 10 gigahertz or so. Then we can tune further. And, and I think it's very nice to see that, that we can just simply tune such a two by two array to a full four quantum dot system. Um, and to move further. Now I mentioned the spin orbit coupling, uh, and this is very relevant in terms of the qubit drive. So initially spin qubits were operated using strip line, both in gallium isonite and in silicon. And here the idea is to have a current, uh, AC current through a line that generates AC magnetic field. And if that's perpendicular to the static magnetic field, uh, it leads to an, an off-diagonal coupling on the Hamiltonian, and therefore Rabi transitions um, between the spin states. Now the challenge there is uh, one is that typically it requires a uh, very high power to drive decent qubit transitions, but also the addressability by itself. It's it's hard to imagine a single strip line to address many many qubits, and so these are challenges in the field: how to have fast qubit operation and how to have local addressability with them. One alternative is to use a local uh, magnet. So if a nano magnet nearby the, the qubit, and then instead of a magnetic field generation, there's an electric field displacing the quantum dot. And if the quantum dot is displaced, it experiences this, this field gradient from the magnet, and that provides then an AC magnetic field. Um, this type of interaction is much faster, leading to typically few tens of megahertz qubit operations or so. But also here, uh, it's an open question how to scale this in two dimensions, because these typically these nanomagnets are not really nano, but are actually relatively large. And so imagining that in, in two dimensions it is really an, an open question. Finally, spin orbit coupling. Um, here, the same as with the nanomagnets, one is, is displacing 
the, the electron um, uh, in the quantum dots. And through the coupling of the, the spin with the orbit, uh, there is an effective magnetic field that then also generates uh, qubit transitions. And this is very efficient and it's intrinsic in the device. Uh, of course, there are now new questions. What about coherence? Uh, uh, is each every qubit very much different and so on? What's the tunability and so forth? But the idea behind it is, is very elegant that, that all of it is, is in the quantum dot itself. It's really like that the transistor becomes uh, the qubit. Um, so here, uh, so in Germanium, a uh, beautiful work has been done by the group of Georgios Katsaros uh, to showcase uh, that the Germanium qubits really can be made. In, and, and something uh, what we took from there is to see, well, can we also go to, to the endpoint and, and um, confine a single hole and make a single hole spin qubit as, as some kind of demonstration of the uh, status of, of the platform. And so here, this was actually a four dot system where we combined two dots as a sensor and then use the other two dots for polyspin upgrade readout and then uh, measure one of the two qubits, for example. So here we are moving to the one one uh, charge uh, situation. And then by simply applying an electric field to one of the gates, we get qubit transitions. So in this case, it was about 50 megahertz. Uh, we can drive faster. Uh, typically, we drive uh, at a transition that, that's optimal for the electronics. So one can drive very fast with human due to spin orbit coupling, typically much faster than the electronics can keep up with. And it seems that around 100 megahertz or so is, is close to the um, um, maximum in terms of fidelity in the end. Okay, so now we have spin orbit coupling. Uh, that's very elegant for driving, but it also means that there's now a new channel uh, that's open for um, um, decoherence. And so one may wonder, okay, it's nice to move them to germanium and many aspects, uh, but what about coherence in this platform? Uh, and so in particular, and by moving from gallium arsenide to natural silicon to silicon 28, we've seen orders of magnitude of improvement. And of course, we want to keep that with germanium. Um, so to explore that, one optimization that we did do is to find out um, ideal quantum well depths. And, and so in particular before the germanium quantum well was located about 20 nanometers below the surface. Um, and, and then uh, the charge noise is still relatively large because of the interaction with defects on the surface. So by moving that to about 55 nanometers, and we find that the charge noise can be even below the detection limits of our system. Uh, and and it, it's really, uh, yeah, very uh, quiet materials development. Still, uh, I would argue that, that in our system, we have a silicon cap, which is a rather dirty system with lots of traps. And so the materials question is how to overcome that, that part. And if we can, I believe we can further reduce the charge noise. But again, I think this is rather encouraging. And that's also what we see uh, when we're trying to make quantum dots. Here, for example, this is again a two by two quantum dot system. And, and here, what was really beautiful, I think we tuned this system in about one day or so, is that we just assumed or predicted what the gate voltage would be to load the single hole, and then assumed that it's identical for all of them, and then defined the virtual gate that would then uh, tune all gates together to the one on one scenario. And so here you see that we tuned a virtual gate that has uh, about one third and two thirds. Um, for one axis, and then again, one third and two thirds for another virtual gate. And so I, uh, it, it was very nice to see that, that without any further assumptions, we can just tune to the desired regime. In addition, if we now apply electric pulses uh, to the qubits and, and uh, tune them to have different resonance frequencies, we have four qubits in one go. And you can already see from here that there's not, not much decay uh, in, in Rabi decay. So that's, that's looking good for coherence. So how does that look like? So as a function of magnetic fields, here you see some uh, um, T2 star measurements. And we find that coherence of T2 star is on the order of one to microseconds. But now we can make uh, a usage of, of the driving speed of germanium. And by applying uh, then dynamical decoupling, we can extend that uh, to a half a millisecond. And that's still in natural germanium. So that, that's, that's very favorable, in particular if you compare 
to kill with logic time scales, which are typically on the order of 10 nanoseconds or so. Okay, I'm standing here in natural germanium. Uh, so you may wonder what is the interaction with a whole spin? Okay, um, one may uh, expect that um, uh, the direct hyperfine interaction. However, if we consider holes, these are described by p type wave function. And so the wave function vanishes at the site of the atomic nuclei. Um, and, and because of that, it's expected that this term is not present. However, since we have a P wave function, there is now a momentum, and that may give rise to dipole dipole interaction and other terms due to spin orbit coupling. Um, and all these terms are predicted to lead to some kind of icing forms uh, when considering heavy holes. So, what does that mean? Okay, so now if the uh, where the uh, form is, is, is along the growth direction of the structure. So if we apply the magnetic field uh, out of plane, uh, we would be probing noise um, that is in the direction of the magnetic field and directly lead to uh, defacing. Uh, and therefore, it's also hard to distinguish from, from other noise sources. If we have an in-plane magnetic field, then we would imagine that the components are only acting out of plane and these are acting then as a transversal field. Now, a transversal field, of course, has a, has a very small component. And so then to probe it, what we do is, is a dynamical decoupling sequences, where we apply a series of pipe pulses. And then in such a sequence, uh, it functions as a band filter, where the waiting time in between those pulses is determining then the frequency uh, of interest. And so when doing that and subtracting the background noise, uh, we clearly see these peaks, and okay, and then we can fit those peaks just assuming uh, a, a germanium seventy three spin at this particular magnetic field, and you can see that we can carefully fit the data, and in particular, if we then more, uh, measure the function magnetic field, uh, we see very carefully that this corresponds to about one half megahertz per tesla. So I think this was a very nice demonstration um, of the interaction of a whole spin with a nuclear spin. Okay, so coherence is good. What does that mean for fidelity? Uh, we've been pushing this a little bit. Still, we're just applying very naive, simple pipe pulses, snow, grape, or whatever, just very simple pulses. And we, uh, we measure using randomized benchmarking. So in a randomized benchmarking, this is a series of Clifford gates where you apply, let's say, sequence of, of pi on two pulses, pipe pulses, and so forth to move to points on the uh, block sphere. And by randomly doing this and increasing the time, you then monitor uh, the final decay. And that, that the reason to do that is that this is a very efficient way to separate the spam errors due to readout immunization from the control uh, errors. And this then gives a control fidelity. And so here we see that with germanium, we now have a fidelity of 99.9899. Uh, it's, it's a shame it wasn't slightly higher than, than that. But I think it's, it's, it's very favorable. And then uh, this is still natural germanium. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I think it's, it's, it's really showing uh, the launch of, of a new platform. If we compare to, to uh, silicon moss, for example, where grape was implemented, it's, it's lower. And it's even uh, that Google Sycamore uh, system is, is uh, functioning, at least with, with some metric less than, than germanium spin qubits. True, if we are starting to simultaneously drive multiple qubits, what we then observe uh, is that there's a loss in fidelity. In our case, this is due to some finite post lock and exchange. So it turns out that with germanium, uh, because of the uh, small effective mass, it's actually very easy to create a large exchange coupling. It's harder to make it very small. And so this, this requires some new designs. Um, but I don't expect this to scale this loss. So in that sense, it's not something that, that will get lower with even more simultaneous driving because it's, it's a very local uh, effect that, that determines this loss. Okay, now to move from single qubit gates to two qubit gates. Um, so earlier we already demonstrated two qubit interactions between uh, whole spins. Now in the two by two, here you see uh, an experiment where we apply a single qubit pulse in preparation and then a two qubit gate. And so then by measuring all the possible permutations, uh, we should either observe nothing when we didn't use that pair or observe the single qubit uh, operation if we just measure half of that sequence or we should see two qubit gates. And here you can nicely see that you know, we, can, we can have all possible permutations um, showcasing full universal logic in this four qubit system. 
what's nice is now, uh, since we have exchange interaction, we can choose to have, for example, one exchange interaction on, but we can also do multiple exchanges on. And, and here, for example, um, uh, you see an experiment where we have a single, double, triple exchange. And then each time you would expect, expect a splitting in, in uh, the frequency. And that's very clearly what we observe as well. Uh, now these three-fold and four-fold um, uh, operations, they come through the three and four qubits uh, gates, particularly the three qubits is, is an Itofoli uh, gate. Um, and if we look at the performance, we can see that we can do all of those multi-qubit gates coherently. Having said that, I, you also can clearly see the loss. And so my, one may wonder or ask the question uh, whether this will be very useful for quantum rotation to reduce the qubit overhead. Maybe it is, it's very efficient. But it's also a challenge because so many aspects have to come together. For quantum simulation, I think this is a very big thing uh, because now one could imagine to have a very large system where you prepare something and then suddenly quench everything. And here you can see that we can do that in a coherent uh, way. So I think that's, that's very uh, encouraging for quantum simulation with germanium. Now to move to quantum computation, we took a different approach and then used the C phase gate. This is also the typical uh, qubit gates, for example, with transform qubits and so uh, And it's very fast because it directly makes use of the exchange interaction. And by tuning that for each uh, qubit pair, we have a full uh, system. And here you see some uh, algorithm that um, in a coherent manner uh, entangles the four qubits and then disentangles again. And so in the below, you see these uh, graphs uh, where the disappearance and appearance of the evolute, uh, oscillations showcase that we can really coherently go through this entire quantum circuit. Now, we've been doing different games with it as well. Uh, and one is, for example, can we do error correction with quantum dot qubits? So if you would just take a single qubit, and here you see an experiment where we do a, a Han echo, so we do a pi on two pulse, then a pi pulse, and then another pi on two pulse, and then somewhere that an error may occur with increasing probability. And what we observe for a single qubit is that there is a linear relation uh, between uh, the chance that a error occurs and the loss in the fidelity that you have at the end. Now, the idea with error correction is then that you can make use of, of multiple qubits to define a better logical qubit. And so here you see a circuit that's doing that. So for example, we're preparing here uh, using uh, an Exxon 2 gate, a superposition state, that's our data. Uh, and we uh, then use some control Z operations as you see here uh, to encode, that, uh, encode a new logical qubit. Then um, we have a point where we introduce uh, a phase flip. Uh, so in particular here, we are interested in the phase flip. If we look at on the T1 time scales, these are typically much longer. And so the dominant uh, error for spin qubits is, is a phase flip error. And so that's the one that we want to correct. And so here, a phase flip may occur in one of these qubits with a certain uh, probability. Um, then we continue the circuit. We have these control Zs here again uh, to decode the logical qubit. And then in the end, we have a Toffoli-like uh, gate. And this Toffoli-like gate, you can naively think of it as, as some kind of majority vote um, uh, to, to uh, correct or not correct the qubit um, if, if or not uh, an error was made. So if we then perform this circuit, then what we see is that for the small qubit errors, in particular in this regime, uh, we, we see with, with two and silica qubits that are a regime where the error has less impact uh, than the linear uh, relation that, that you would get for a single qubit. Of course, I have to uh, state here that because we use this Toffoli like gate and so forth, there's already a big loss in the operation itself. And so we're not at a point that, that we're getting better qubits by defining logical qubits. But what I think is very nice to see is that the algorithm is really functioning and we can do that and execute it with quantum qubits and see regimes where it starts to be getting better. In addition, I can also imagine that this is useful for quantum memories. Um, by projecting it on other qubits and then doing dynamical decoupling, for example, to extend to coherence while doing other things with the data qubits. So finally, um, I would like to mention that, that actually here I've been focusing on, on quantum dots, um, uh, CMOS technology and so forth, uh, but the Germanium platform is actually much broader than that. Uh, in particular, 
in germanium, we can make contact to uh, 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 metals, uh, which is very uh, appealing for the definition of, of charge sensors. So we don't need to dope the system and we can make very local charge sensors that, that, that's very efficient. But these metals may also be a superconductor. And so some of the work we showed here and also with the group of George Katsaros is that, that this platform may enable uh, the integration of superconductors with uh, germanium two decks. And I believe that's very promising for uh, new kind of quantum technologies uh, and hybrid systems. And so a particular vision is maybe to scale up where you have an integrated quantum device, where you have modules of spin qubits that then are interconnected, for example, by a resonator or some other kind of means using the superconductivity to create space uh, for the electronics and to really make an integrated quantum system. Uh, and next to that, I think it's very much for fundamental physics. There's also a new possibilities um, here by making uh, where we can use this kind of advanced technology uh, to study fundamental physics. So finally, I want to come back to um, the original uh, proposal from Daniel Loss and David Di Vincenzo in 1998, where they proposed quantum worlds for quantum computation. And what you can see here is that in their cartoons, uh, the, the circles weren't perfect. And, and they had a reason for that. And, and the reason for that is that in their mind, uh, quantum dots are not perfect. Every quantum dot is different. And I believe that everyone, every experimental person uh, working with, with quantum dot experienced that, um, that, that you have to build to some extent almost a relationship with, with your device to understand it, where it's going and so forth. And, and something I think what we have seen in the last few years and in particular in germanium is that this personality is slowly uh, disappearing, enabling us to go faster and faster. So there's lots of materials challenges there, but I think we're getting close um, to systems uh, where we have fewer qubits than IOs. And I think that that will be very amazing if we can take that same route with, with quantum technology as we did with classical technology. Um, and I can't show too much at the moment, but just as a teaser, uh, we now have uh, a 16 qubit device called 14 dots are tuned and they are actually made using this technology. So I think we're really starting to see the first directions of that, that we, that we can scale more efficiently than we did do before. Finally, I want to uh, acknowledge uh, my group and in particular, uh, Nico Hendricks, which I did do, I believe did do an amazing job. Uh, when he started as a PhD, Actually, we wanted to work on, on silicon, and then we found out that the group of Giordano Scapucci uh, was at the stage of growing germanium. I believe Giorgio Scatoas was, was even uh, mentioning to me, like, you know, do you really want to work with germanium? It's unstable. And Nico was, was one of the person that was really brave enough to, to explore uh, that direction. And, and I think that that was really one of the drivers by a lot of these uh, results. Finally, uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Manu, for the nice talk, even though this was the third one for today for you. It was still exciting and uh, enthusiastic. Nice. Um, so the, we, we have uh, plenty of time for discussions. And uh, in the Zoom chat, there is already a request and a question. So let me start with the request quickly. So Manu, if, if you would have like five more minutes after the discussion to connect to the Discord server and up, upload your slides, if you, if you don't mind sharing the, your slides as a PDF file. It would be nice. So that's one request. Yeah, I'm happy to do so. I have to see if I can figure out how to create an account. Uh, uh, I think you, okay, okay, we can discuss this later. Or even you can, yeah. if you just email it to me, I can, I can upload it. Yeah. Okay, so question. Um, Pavlo Pishkin asks, naive question, how we can be sure that a single electron in a dot does not interact with a huge number of electrons in the bulk? How, this how is this electron separated from the other electrons? Um, so the question is more or less like if we have a single electron or a single hole, uh, what's the um, interaction with its surrounding? Um, well, this, this can be at different levels, right? So one thing we can do is just make a quantum dot and see if the presence of an electron or hole is stable over time, right? So we can just store it there. And that's something that, that we can do in, in, in all of these platforms for, for a long time. So this will be a very boring experiment. You can store it. And, and if your fridge doesn't warm up, you can come back next year and it will be there. 
on, on a higher level, there are some dynamics and there will be interaction with its surroundings. Uh, typically with, with many electrons in a metal, there the interaction is not so much because the metal efficiently screens itself. There's, there's little dynamics in time. It's more the impurities that, that may be in the material uh, that are fluctuating over time that causes interaction. And so this is something that we can measure. Uh, this is also something I showed. Uh, how we do that is, is we make an, a single electron transistor uh, where we have a certain current. And then by taking time traces, we can measure the noise of the current, how stable is it over times. And then by taking the Fourier of that, of the time, we get a frequency. And then we get the one over or the frequency spectrum of the noise. Right? And that tells us a lot on, on the information. And so, for example, here I showed that, that we uh, see devices where the charge noise is less than 0.2 microelectron volt per square hertz. To put that in perspective, in, typically in silicon, it's something like one to a Q. And even in gallium arsenide, it, it's higher. So we, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's the time scale on which we can probe it. Uh, one follow-up uh, question is, I mean, sometimes people quote charge noise as an on-site energy fluctuation, like a, you imagine like it's a Gaussian quasi-static noise, and it's characterized by not the prefactor of the one over F spectrum, but by, by just one micro EV number. Is it a reasonable thing to do? Or, and if it is, then how would you convert your, your numbers to, to such a micro electron volt fluctuation? Um, so th this is exactly um, what we do, right? So um, uh, we measure uh, via the lever arms, we can find out in, in energy um, the fluctuations. Um, still, I, 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 so I think in, in a way, I, I think this, this experiment is fair that, that we, uh, what we do see is that it's not so much setup dependent or so that, that we can are able to um, detect the intrinsic noise of the system and get uh, that values if it's not too low, right? For example, we know that our setup is here bounded to this 0.2 microelectron volts in, in Hertz. Um, there are other things that, that here are a bit opened. Uh, for example, the one of ref noise, we don't really understand uh, where this comes from, uh, right? So, so in particular, one relevant thing here is that our quantum world is typically small. And so we have a finite number of traps that we interact with. And, and so this may lead to very different and complicated uh, spectrum. Sometimes, for example, we see it's also temperature independent, which one would not expect from, from these similar models. And so, um, yeah, I guess there are more answers. I think that the experiment in that sense is fair. And I think here, by converting this to energy, that, that's, that's a good metric. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, the discussion is much bigger uh, in the sense that, that our thinking of, of uh, what determines this noise is, is um, not, not sophisticated enough. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Maybe just one more follow-up uh, interpretation of this question. Uh, is, if I understand correctly, in your readout method, uh, don't you use a Fermi, Fermi reservoirs, electronic reser reservoirs? Didn't really discuss how you read out the qubits, but maybe that's another way how how you how these isolated electrons interact with some yeah. environment, right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, uh, yeah. And it's I, I uh, go over it uh, all quite fast. I think there's just a lot of things to say. Um, so we make use of body spinning gates, or maybe to give more general answer. Uh, typically, there are two methods. One is Altman readout, where you have a reservoir and then you have a splitting. And then the electron hole can go out or not if it has a favorable energy. Uh, the other one is poly spin gates. And, and I think this is very much the way to go in scaling up. Uh, Altamon is something like if you have just one dot, then you will make use of that. Uh, but it's not something that you want to do if you have more. In particular, with Altamon readouts, you're kind of fixing your qubit resonance frequency uh, because you want to have it large. And so the frequency must be large. And this is typically not good from an operational perspective. And with polyphon, you really separate the two. And you don't need to first order that reservoir. Now, if you then go uh, in Germanium, where you have spin orbit coupling, uh, then in particular, if you want to read out, for example, um, uh, the pairs, for example, here, the horizontal line, and for example, also the vertical line, then at least one of the two uh, will be uh, having a very um, fast relaxation. Uh, because of the spin orbit coupling. 
so then directly doing polyspin markets, that, that doesn't work so well. So what we do is making use of a mechanism called latch readout. And that's actually what we do on all our experiments. Uh, and with the latch readout, what we do is that we move to a transition such that the um, uh, one of the two states can tunnel, let's say from the one one to the O2. But if it is doing that, it will go to another reservoir and it will go away. And now we pulse back. And so then we have a kind of pulsing sequence that enables the readout, but we don't need to integrate over that time. But then in the end, we can just have a charge stable state and then take our time to uh, read out that and get a much higher signal. So that, that's really to separate T1 from, from, from readout. And, 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 and that seems to be relatively efficient. Maybe a final note here. I'm studying polyspin markets. Um, be aware that once there's spin orbit coupling, there can be lots of different regimes. In particular, we often uh, operate at the regime where the down down couples to the O2 because of the spin orbit coupling and the uh, anti parallel states not. And then the up up actually relaxes very fast to the down down and then couples in. So it's, it's, it's uh, often that the we get the opposite signal as what you would expect without spin orbit coupling. Mm -hmm. uh, although, you know, the starting points, of course, are the same. Yeah. Thanks. Um, going on uh, through the list of questions, Devdut Sharma is asking how the nuclear spin and the quantum dot interaction occurred. So maybe this is a question regarding the origin of, of this interaction, nuclear spin electron spin interaction. Um, yeah, so um, something that, that um, what we observe is that at least in the transversal field, there is a coupling. Uh, and, and so in all other specs, this is very hard to disentangle, right? So if it's <clears throat> the longitudinal part, um, it's, it's, it's a question whether this is due to nuclear spin or whether this is electrical noise. And typically both of them have the same kind of uh, spectral um, shape. And, and so it's hard to disentangle from the two. Um, in addition, um, so we were probing here the transversal uh, uh, effect. Um, this is expected to be relatively large for, for both the dipole-dipole interaction, but also mechanisms that are coupled by the spin orbit coupling. Again, these two terms have a similar impact. And so we cannot discriminate between the two. And so dipole-dipole is, is something that, that may be uh, what you're observing, uh, though we cannot exclude that actually the mechanism is via some zoom or until coupling. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, next question from Florian Ginzel. Can you tease a bit more? Is the 16 qubit device you mentioned a 1D array, or have you managed to make it 2D? Is this a. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, go to my presentation next year, hopefully. <laughs> and, um, so to, to say a bit more, so this is actually a four by four. Uh, I very like, much like to going in 2D. So this is four by four and then having four charge centers on the sides. Yeah. And so as I'm mentioning, like this is with shared control. And, and so uh, in 1D, you can, so I would argue a one dimensional system is not scalable. There are even papers from people uh, that, that claim scalable one dimensional system. And why do I believe that one dimensional system is not scalable? Because by definition, we will need as many IOs as we have qubits. And so we will need that everything needs to be scaled if you make one more. In a two dimensional scale, then you can have strategies that, for example, in, in simple crossbar go with a square root. And in classical technologies, there are further strategies to make it even lower. And so in our 16 qubit system, um, we are targeting for the first time. Uh, to have a system where we have fewer lines than the number of qubits. And so this is also why it's so hard to tune. So we now have 14 of the 16 dots, but uh, yeah, it's, it's challenging to tune because we have so few lines and, and we need to control everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, so are there any simple ideas for uh, like reading out uh, like some internal qubits? So we have a four by four array and four of them are like inside the array. And I, as far as I remember, uh, in superconducting qubits, people use like air bridges to get into the central qubit and so on. So, uh, and what are your thoughts? Or what are your plans in, in implementing readout for those? Internet? Yeah, yeah. Well, this, this can go in multiple directions, uh, right? So, there's one aspect if, if dispersive readout, if, if that works well, then this will be a very elegant way to um, read out multiple qubits where you can make use of strategies. Where, for example, you use two lines for the um, uh, dispersive readout, 
uh, where the combination of the two frequencies is the one that you want to print, right? So then you have a unique way of addressing. And, and so uh, overall, I would also argue that, that the way to think about this is, is to really come from, let's say from DRAM technology where you use two elements together to get something unique. Uh, this works for uh, dispersive readout. It works also if you can in integrate sensors inside. And, and so I'm very much of the opinion um, that uh, the, not the way to go is to have, for example, only sensors at the edges or so, and then try to make something very large. Uh, we have to um, have some finite overhead due to integrated sensors, but then try to make it to the array of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as far as I understand, these uh, dispersive readout is using uh, uh, resonators. So what is the count of the resonators? For example, if you have a four by four array, you have four internal qubits. Do you need four resonators? Can you use just one or how does that scale? Um, well, this, this is probably very much connected to, to, to what kind of uh, circuit uh, you wanna have. So I don't mm -hmm. think like, um, so first of all, I, I think the scaling can be with a square root, which is perhaps already sufficient. Uh, but probably it, it can be even less uh, than that um, because we don't need to have readout on each and every unique point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, yeah. so we don't need to have resonators on all sides, right? We could have one, let's say, dynamic drive on one side and have resonators only on one side. Mm -hmm. so, so there's a uh, significant reduction uh, right. insufficiently. Uh Josip Kukuchka uh, asks, for the four by four qubit device, do you use multi-layer gate structure? And if yes, how many layers? <laughs> it's great to have a discussion on the thing that I didn't show. I, I should do this more often to have more thesis uh, uh, on this. That's good, that's fun. Uh, yeah, now, so uh, also here, um, I, I, I don't believe the way to go is to go more and more layers. Um, perhaps to we'll come again from an industrial perspective, I think that most people use something like 20 to 30 masks and something like 20 layers at most, right? So that, that's for the big chips. And so for us, we, I think we should have that kind of mantra also where we uh, don't have another layer for another dot and, and this should not increase. And so in, in all designs, we will never go to something more than three or four layers or so. But here by using the shared control, we don't need to do that. Mm -hmm. But because since it's shared, there is no thing that scales uh, in terms of layers. Yeah. Right. Um, we we still have seven minutes from discussion. I have infinite questions, infinite many questions, so I can go on. But I also encourage others to ask other questions. Um, so I I'm curious about uh, readout in two aspects. So the first first one is I understand this latching mechanism. But, but what you do is that dispersive readout of the confinement gate, or you use another charge sensor dot, uh, which is connected yeah, to, yeah, yeah. to do the readout. For example, in the image that you see here, there's an RF sensor here on the side, and, and that's what we use. And, and so the RF sensor is only then the measuring uh, the charge state in the end. So that, that's one uh, island or quantum dot, which is connected to a single reservoir or two reservoirs, or? Um, yeah, one, and you can, it's on the edge, but you can see it here, for example, this one and here one. Uh, in this case, that reservoir is, is just, um, 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 in this case, it's aluminum. So mm -hmm. we either use aluminum or platinum. So we directly use a metal and that's our reservoir. Mm -hmm. So there's but no the two deck or something that's connected, but it's directly going to a metal. Okay, but, but there is current flowing through the, the sensor or this is just exactly. going back and forth, going through. Okay, yeah. I see. Um, and, and how much, more difficult would, would it be to do gate-based dispersive sensing? Um, something what I believe is, is kind of interesting in, in Germanium um, is that, again, uh, we can integrate superconductors. And so what you can imagine is that uh, this superconductor here, this aluminum, is not um, connected to a sensor, but is directly connected to the qubit of interest. And by doing that, uh, there's, it seems like a marginal difference with, with silicon, but imagine there you typically have these gates on the top far away, maybe you have your 60 nanometer quantum bell or so, 
And then there are lots of gates that, that reduce lever arms. If you can diffuse in a metal, this will be tonical, but then have a very strong lever arm. Similar as the source in a drain contact of an SET always have a much stronger effect uh, than the, the gate on top. So by doing that, I think we can gain something like five times or an order of magnitude or so compared to uh, what people do with dispersive readouts uh, in typical silicon quantum wells. Um, and there people have been able to, at least with on-chip resonators, uh, been able to do this very efficiently. Mm -hmm. So things like strong spin photon coupling, and so I, I, I imagine that that um, is, is much more feasible in germanium. Um, of course, it's another question whether I believe this is the way for it for scaling up systems, but studying those kind of things, I, I believe is, is uh, um, yeah, much more feasible in germanium. Mm -hmm. Next question uh, from Daniel Irovets. Hi, thanks for the nice talk on slide 22. You show the individual driving of the qubits. I guess the oscillation frequency depends on the spin of the interaction strength orientation, as I see a difference among the qubits. Could you comment? Does this somehow correlate with longer T2? Um, which slide? 22. 22, so this one. Yeah. Uh, okay, but so here, um, and so uh, I, there's maybe more to this. So in terms of um, qubit speed, uh, since we're using multiple lines to drive the qubits, uh, we cannot really compare uh, the powers that we're using, right? So, and actually we, we also don't care too much. So what we rather do is that we just tune a power to get a certain speed that we desire. And so in this case, they weren't tuned to be uh, identical. But for example, later on when uh, I showed randomized benchmarking, so for the simultaneous operation, each qubit is tuned to uh, be of identical speeds. That also leads to one of the, is also one of the magnets because of uh, loss in fidelity, because we do it all with the same speed. Um, now the effectiveness of, of driving um, is depending also on, on local differences. Um, of course, so how strong is the spin orbit coupling? How much is the movability of, of the quantum and so forth? And all these aspects will lead to a different behavior uh, of that. Uh, but since we're making, you know, at least in this part, making use of, of different lines, uh, we can just tune uh, to any desired speed by just choosing the right power. Thanks. Uh, I think the final question is coming from Yorgos Katsaros, who you mentioned a few times in the talk. Uh, great talk, Menno. In your four qubit device, can you switch exchange interaction completely off for all pairs of quantum dots? Um, so it's it's one thing that's important um, here to realize is that um, we have been doing this an, uh, entire experiment uh, by choosing a DC setting and then only applying AC pulses for whatever we want, quantum circuits, uh, multi qubit gates, and so forth. So I would say like if we would change DC, we can be much more drastically in, in, in gate space and, and make it much weaker than desired, but here we just wanted to be more efficient and, and just only do AC pulsing. Um, and there we see that, that we can cover, let's say on, well, to, to something like, like a, a terahertz, even or something like this in, in coupling and as low as, as something uh, on the order of, of, well, below one megahertz. Um, and, and I think we can go lower if, if we would retune the system. Uh, but the dynamic range we covered thus far is, 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 is this. And so there is some residual uh, interaction between the two. Um, yeah. But I believe that that's more a matter of tuning than, than it is on, on what we did do. Uh, though bear in mind that germanium has a smaller effective mass. And so there will be more residual uh, coupling because of the larger dot size. Thank you very much, Menno. Thank you for this uh, marathon of question and answer.